Hello and welcome to episode two in season two of the Don't Give a Ruck podcast. I'm your host, Nathan Parker, and I'm delighted to say today's guest is the South African-born French international second row, Bernard Leroux. Uh, Having gained 44 caps for his adopted country, Bernard has become a mainstay in the side at test level, as well as for his club, Racing 92. Myself and Bernard began the show by discussing the impact of the pandemic and how it affected the 31-year-old. Enjoy. So, well, probably, probably the best place to start, Bernard, is, is with your health and well-being. How have you coped over the last 12 months or so with the, the pandemic and the lockdown? Yeah, I've actually been great. I think lockdown's done me good. I feel like um, my body's had a good rest during lockdown. I was back home for three months. I, got to, I did lockdown in South Africa. Nice. And I came back pretty fresh. I haven't been sick since. And, um, yeah, my form's been good and I've been feeling good and... We're privileged to be playing at this stage. Um, I think there's so many people that's lost their jobs and that, that's, that's struggling. So, yeah, just grateful to be, be on the field and doing what I, what I love doing and training and just keep going. And thankfully, the news that we all wanted uh, was that France are, are now definitely playing in the Six Nations. It was a, it was a bit hit and miss uh, a few weeks ago, but now it's all <laughs> been sorted. Has that come up as quite a relief? Yeah, listen, I've, at this moment, we're just going with whatever they decide. Mm-hmm. We, we're just proving if, if we can take part in a competition, we know it's tough times for everyone. Um, mm-hmm. Obviously, we would like to play as much as possible, get experience. We've got a young French side, so we just want to get as much experience going into um, 2023 World Cup. I think that's what we're building towards. And um, yeah, so just, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. I'm really grateful we can, we can be part of the Six Nations again. Mm. And well, even better news for yourself. You were actually picked in the thirty-seven man squad. You, you've been sort of a mainstay in the, uh, the I was going to say South African squad. Then I was going to get that wrong <laughs> in the French team for the last few years. The, the excitement for this tournament must be sky high, especially after the last eighteen months or so. Yeah, I think we were really gutted losing or not losing, not winning the mm. the previous uh, Six Nations. Um, we were young side and we were building like. So we're looking forward to compete again and, and hopefully um, be contestants for the, for the Cup. And um, we know there's a lot of work going in and we know it will be a complete different uh, context this year as well. Uh, last year we were a young team and we were sort of the underdogs. Uh, no one really knew us. Where this year it will be a bit, bit different. So, but we're really looking forward to the challenge. And uh, me especially, I'm looking forward to getting back with the group on Sunday and seeing the boys. Uh. And, well... I think the last 16 of your tests, I think they've all come at second row. But prior to that, I always remember watching you in the back row at, at a six or a seven or an eight. Um, do you feel more comfortable at the second row? I think I'm a bit older now, so shifting to the second <laughs> row. You'd be probably... It, it, it was always going to happen. I, I always said I won't play second row before I'm 30 years old, so I turned 30 about a year and a half ago. And um, I guess I've, I've shifted into the cage a bit now. But yeah, with the with second row, the role of second row is changing so much over the the last few years. Just being more mobile, and the old pack is sort of more mobile. That's modern rugby is just all about playing playing more mobile style. And um, yeah, I fit in quite nicely there. I'm, I mean, I'm starting to enjoy it. In the beginning, it was a bit tough shifting from third row to second row, mm-hmm. but I'm starting to enjoy it. And and I've also learned much over the last two years, and that because it's it's quite a change in lineouts and scrumming and getting around the park differently. Um, so yeah, at the moment, I'm just really enjoying it. And I'm glad to still be part of the French team, even if that's the way it's like. I'll play for international rugby. If they, if they pick me in prop, I'd probably still say yes. So I'm just glad to be, be in the mix. Well, where did the, the move come from? Was you sort of not forced into the position, but did a coach pull you to one side and say, you know, I think you'd be better suited at lock? I think I've always sort of helped out. 2016, we played... Um, we played the European Cup final and top 14 final and I played lock both of those games um, as we had injuries and I just sort of filled in and they realized that it's better having more loose forwards on the field as I had a loose forward profile running a lot and, and having a big work rate. Um, and then I just sort of, yeah, they, they, they saw that and then they sort of asked me a few times, I would mind helping out if they had injuries or things. And yeah, it just it wasn't planned. Like I didn't make the shift over a few days it was just over career helping out in the start and then just sort of went went there and fell into that post mm. I asked you that because it's well for me personally it seems like you're playing the best rugby of your career especially in a French jersey thank you very much I really appreciate it but um, yeah there's still a lot to learn and there's a lot a lot of work before the next World Cup 
Just don't do it against Wales. Um, <laughs> uh, let's take you back to your earlier days now, uh, Bernard, growing up in South Africa. Um, were you aware of your French roots, even from a young age? Yeah, my, my grandmother always told us about our French roots. And see, she loved the French. She, she used to put on French songs and stuff. But I, I've ne- I never really take, take, take notice of that and um, sort of thought about it. I never thought I would end up in France. Um, so yeah, it just sort of came over my way. But um, yeah, it's not like it was planned. I was, I was supposed to come over to France for three months. And 11 years later, I'm still here. So, but I really enjoyed it. And, I, and I'm enjoying it at the moment as well. Yeah, we'll get onto that in a minute. But when you were younger, was it sort of, was it either you were going to play cricket or rugby, or was it always going to be rugby? I was actually swimming professionally for quite a quite a while. That was my main sport, and um, I played rugby in my local town. So like every, all boys in South Africa play rugby since you know, started six years old, and it's sort of a religion. And I was always, I wouldn't say good, but I was. I was from a really small town, small schools. I was I was an okay rugby player, and I swam a bit more than I played rugby. Mm. And when I was 18 years old, uh, coach Alan Zondag, he was actually Western Province and assistant coach to Springboks. And he had an academy. It was called RPC Rugby Performance Center. He came to see me, and he told me he thinks I've got a lot of talent. I should give it a go to play rugby. And I told him, no, but <laughs> I'm not going to waste money. I'm, I want to go study marine biology. <laughs> and because um, I, I didn't th- honestly I didn't thought I would end up a professional sports um, maybe a swimmer but I didn't even think I would I would end up a professional rugby player I wanted to go study and um, he told me to give it a go and after convincing me I, I did go to the academy for a year and things just happened really fast from there on yeah well, I was, I was going to ask you obviously you sound like you're a late bloomer but was South Africa playing for the Springboks ever in your mind after that decision I think growing up Every boy in South Africa dreams about playing for the Springbok or playing international rugby. I, I didn't think I was that good. I, I, I wasn't that confident in myself that I would end up as a professional sports person. Yeah. And I heard a story somewhere that Jake White wanted you at the Lions in 2010. But instead, you, I think on, on the night that he asked you, you, you were going to sign, that you, you signed for Racing Metro instead on the same night. Is that true? Yeah, that's true. So I had the options of going to the going to the Lions. I was with Springbok Sevens for on a training camp for quite a while, mm-hmm. and I had the option to go to play Super Rugby for the Lions. And at the same time, I had the option to go down to racing. So I, yeah, I decided to to go to racing for three months as a medical joker. I thought it would be a great experience to get out of the country and um, just experience something different. So South Africa is quite isolated. It's far from everything else. So I've I've always been open-minded and wanted to travel and wanted to see the world and stuff so it's a good opportunity for me to get out and go experience something else and i ended up in france and paris which is a great place i really loved it yeah and uh, yeah just ended up staying here but well in fact i think there was an opportunity even after you were were in racing metro that you you could have gone back to south africa but i believe you loved paris too much yeah that's true 2013 i was actually just before i started playing for france um I was offered a contract by the Bulls and I had a chance. They, they told me if I come back, I would have a chance to play for the Springboks. And I, I just decided, no, I was, I was happy at racing. The, just the way they treated us, and it was sort of like family to me. And um, yeah, I decided I'm going to stay in France and give it a go to, to play for France. And, and I've, I haven't looked back. I haven't since. Um, yeah, it's, been, it's worked out really great for me. Yeah. Well, what is this specifically about France and, and Paris in particular that you loved so much? Because... I've talked to Jamie Cudmore and, and he was telling me about living out in France and he opened <coughs> wine bars. I mean, is it the nightlife? Is it, is it just the sightseeing? You know, what's so great about France and Paris? I think it's really central. Paris itself is a great city. It's, oh, you, can, you can never run out of things to do. Restaurant, not at this moment, but <laughs> restaurants. You know, it's just traveling wise is really central so if you if you stay in paris and, you, and you've got off weekends easy all the trains all the flights and stuff that goes from you can just hop for a weekend to italy or get on the train go to london or yeah so for me they wanted to experience europe and um, and different countries and, and different cultures it, it's a great place to be based at and um yeah the culture the food the people is very nice like oh when i when i first came here the people well they told me the people is going to be really miserable and the french people's this and that but i I've not experienced that. The people's all been very nice and I've settled in quite nicely. And um, yeah, it's a great place, place to live. Have you managed to pick up some of the accent or? 
<laughs> Every now and then I speak English and someone tells me, hey, you've got a bit of a French accent. <laughs> um, yeah, sometimes I get, after 10 years now, I started losing my words. When I speak Afrikaans to my mom, I throw in a French word. Or when I speak English to someone, I'd use a French word. Or, or the other way around, and I'll mix up some words. But um, no, I think I'm, I'm okay speaking French and English and, and, and South Afrikaans. Yeah. Uh, well, stick with racing 92. Well, it was racing retro and that was racing 92. The progression over the last, I would say, three or four years that the team has made, you mentioned it earlier, you made, I think it was two Champions Cup finals. And you won the the champion uh, the top fourteen in in two thousand sixteen or seventeen. Um, is it the aim this season to get your hands on that coveted European Cup finally? Personally, that's my main goal. That's one of my main goals. If, if I could play another World Cup and win a European Cup, that's I've lost three finals with racing, um, and yeah, that's probably the hardest part of my career losing those finals. Um, some of them we should have lost. Some of them we should have won. Um, We've came very close, but yeah, hopefully in the next three, three and a half years before I end up my career, I could, I could go and put that star on the racing jersey that we've been longing for so long. Well, it can't be as, as bad luck as, as Claremont. I think Claremont lost about 50 <laughs> That's then... rude, mate. That's rude. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, down the years, you've acquired some of the best players in the world, the likes of Dan Carter, uh, Jamie Roberts, um, Joe Rockefoco. But the side now um, has got a really good blend of I would say, a really strong forward pack as well as the likes of Finn Russell, Vakatawa, uh, Emoff, Zebo, and so on. Um, is it fair to say this is probably the best RAS inside that you've been a part of? I have to say, since, since I started racing, we had, we had great players. Um, I mean, we started out with Sebastian Chabal and Andrew Mertens when I first arrived here and so many other legends that's played Francis Stein and so many other legends that's played with you over the year. But I think the team we've got at the moment the last three has been really complementary to each other. We've got we've got a good balance everywhere, and I think that's why we're doing well. We've also got good depth in the squad. We've got a big squad of I'll say around forty players, and and racing's done really well by putting up a very good academy. So um, it's quite tough for them to stay in the sal- in the in the salary cap. But now, as we've got a good academy with young guys coming through, we've just got this depth. Which uh, top fourteen is very long, so we can we've got a good turnaround with good them. Um, We've, yeah, I won't say A and B side, but we've got a we've got such good players and depth that can fill in and everywhere, and I think that's that's where we've really made a difference. And does it help? I, I'm sure you're fluent in French now after so many years of staying in France. But does it help when some of these come over or from New Zealand or Australia to South Africa? Does it help that that camaraderie of having English speakers in the squad? Not just not just English speaking. I think every culture is different and I think where racing is also good they learn from all the new players from the New Zealand the South African guys the Australian guys come and everyone brings something new mm-hmm. and everyone adds to the, to this winning re- recept I don't know how to say it um, yeah so um, everyone brings a bit to the table and over the years we've I've learned quite a bit from all the other foreign even from the Fijian guys and um, everywhere even the Georgians and scrumming um, I think there's there's something to learn from each culture has got his, his strong points and I think you should take what's good from all of them and, and mix it up in a team. That's, that's what makes it different and, and brilliant. Did um, Jamie Roberts give you any Welsh slang to learn? <laughs> no, man. <laughs> I had some good times with Mike Phillips and Jamie Roberts in Paris, I can tell you that. <laughs> uh, back, in the, back in the day, three of us were all single and we enjoyed the Paris nightlife and all that. But, <laughs> but you can't say anything to do with Mike Phillips. No, nothing in the world. So no, he's pretty- and I've seen him commentating and, and, and talking, and but um, no, he hasn't, he hasn't learned me anything. <laughs> well, bar the COVID restriction, restrictions, you would have been playing in the European Cup, I believe, this weekend or last weekend. Um, yeah. What have you made of the decision to, to move, um, well, almost get rid of the group stages altogether after two games and go straight to the last, last 16? What have you made of that move? Yeah, it's really tough to comment on that. Like we said, we're just fortunate to still play rugby at this moment, go on to top 14, um, obviously devastated by the, by the decision, but uh, it's, it's tough times for everyone, we have to understand. I just really hope it goes on. Like I said, I've, I've got big ambition to still compete and win that title. Mm-hmm. So hopefully we can, towards the end of the season, we can catch up and, and just finish that tournament and um, hopefully have another go at that, at that cup this season. Mm. And domestically, I believe you're third in the table at, at this current time, and you're yeah. playing the game tomorrow. Um, years gone by, I, I've watched the top 14, and I don't know whether it's just bad luck of the games that I've watched, but a lot of the games were maybe one try in it, or 
maybe there was 10 penalties and they were all kicks. But it seems now that the likes of Toulouse and yourselves at Racing Metro are bringing a lot more flair and is, is being represented in the, the French national team. So we've got the Gallagher Premiership and Pro 14 over here, but how would you compare the, the top 14 to the leagues we have over in the UK? Um, I think it's a bit different. I think at the beginning of the season, the weather plays a big a big thing. Racing, we're, we're fortunate to play in the arena. I don't know if you've seen it. Um, it's it's closed and, and it's... Yeah, the amount of tries scored there is just so much more than, and and the game plan and 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 the expansion of the game is so much more in in the arena. So the weather definitely makes a big difference. When we play here, there's an average of what six, seven tries a game. Where if you play outside, it's there's one or two. So it's just it's just the game plans which, which changes up a bit once you play outside on muddy terrain, wet balls. Um, also, if, if you look towards the beginning or the end of the season where it gets close to summer, games get faster, we have seen more tries. So it's a lot to do with that. It's just Northern Hemisphere rugby, I reckon. Um, well, even even in the Six Nations, I think there's a lot of kicking, a lot of mauling and scrumming, and, and you get a bit of play. But once you once you get to Southern Hemisphere playing warmer weather, it's different types of games. So, yeah, weather plays a, makes a massive difference. Uh, let's bring it to the national team now. And from a Welsh perspective... I want to know what he's like working under Sean Edwards. I've had him on the show and he seems like a really nice guy. But what's he like to work under? I, I love it. I, honestly, I, I never thought I'd ever like to coach or be involved in rugby afterwards. And then I started working with Sean Edwards and I got home after training one day and I told my wife, I want to do what this guy's doing after rugby. <laughs> he's great. He's unbelievable. He's so effective in what he does. He's short and sharp. He's a really good analyst of the game. Um, his vision is unbelievable. Just the things you see that no one other sees when he does anal- game analysts. And um, yeah, man, his communication, just the way he is, he brings, he brings character to a team. Um, so yeah, I absolutely loved working with him. Is his French improving or has he still got a, a Northern England accent? <laughs> I don't think he'll lose it, but uh, no, he's, he's making a massive effort. He's even got French class in his room when we're at Marcusi. Marcusi is our training center for the French team. So he, he's, got, and he, he's constantly trying to do his video sessions in short French phrases and stuff. So he's, he's progressing and he's making, he's making a year's effort and he's settling in quite nice with the boys. Everyone likes him. He brings, like, he's a great character in the team. Mm. Did, did, did you expect him to have such an impact? Because even from the first game against England in the Six Nations, you could see, I think England were camped on your line. I think you went 17 nil up. England were then camped on your line for a, a good chunk of that first half. Yeah. Everybody could see the impact that he'd made straight away. So what was it in the training sessions that was, you know, changed you as a team defensively? He just makes you understand what he wants from you. And he, may, he, he, he communicates with each player individually in, in a good way. He knows his players and he, he knows how to get the best out of you. And he just, yeah, he's, like I said, he's short and effective. So we do short draws with him, but it's so effective and it's, it's all concentrated on the on the games you're going to have the weekend, what type of play the, the opposition is doing. So, um, yeah, he's just effective and analysis is so good. And, and, and that's the way he coaches well. He uses, he, he spends a lot of time in front of the computer and he uses everything he's got for that weekend. Yeah, he's amazing. Amazing guy. Yeah, and brilliant. We, we've talked about the defence. Let's talk about the French attack and the French flair that has certainly come back and is probably the best I've seen during my lifetime at this moment in time. I think a lot of people talk about the 90s and the French teams and the backs that they had back then with Castagnet and Intermac, the, obviously the father of uh, the fly half. Uh, but as a forward, is it as simple as just get clean ball and the backs will do the rest? I think we play in the right areas of the, of the field as well, where before we sort of kicked when we were under pressure. We've got good defence. Mm. We've got a good kicking game now and we play in the right areas of the, of the field and use, use our time well when we're in the opposition's half. So, um, yeah, that's where we change a lot. We've got brilliant coaches that, like I said, they, like every, Fabian Galtier, um, good lineup, good, good scrum coaches. Like for the first time, I feel like we're sort of not trying to catch up with other teams, but we're actually trying to compete and be in front of them and, and just lift the bar and, and make other teams want to, to do what we're doing. We're like I always felt before my first few years with friends, I felt like we were chasing either the Springboks or New Zealand. We were always watching what they're doing, trying to copy. We were now sort of creating our own style of play and we, it suits our team. Yeah, it's strange because almost every World Cup that I've watched, maybe since 2007, there's always that thing of France, well, people saying France always have that one game in them. But it looks like this French team can 
can go on a run of games without losing and, and you can go on a run of winning. Is it change, has the mentality changed as a team also? I think we're definitely working towards that. We want to we want to be a competitive side, and like I said, we're a young side. And um, if we win some cups on the way to the World Cup, mm. that's a bonus. We just want to want to work towards the World Cup and be a great side in the World Cup and and be competitive and and uh, compete for that title. So that's our main main goal. And on our way there, we'll 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 try to be a consistent team. That's that's really one of our main goals, just to be consistent and yeah. Mm. And I, well, I don't know when the World Player of the Year is announced, but surely your scrum half, uh, Antoine Dupont, is, is going to be right up there. What was he like to play with? Oh, he's an amazing bloke and he's a great player. He's, like, I mean, he's so explosive and even us, we don't always know what he's going to do, but um, it, only, it always works out well. And especially him playing with Roman in the same team in Toulouse, I think they're really experienced um, scrum off and fly off. Um, even though they're young, they've got quite a bit of experience playing together in the top 14, so that helps a bit. Um, we'll see how it gets if, if we like we're going into the Six Nations with Ad Roman having another fly off. Um, so we'll see how that goes. But um, yeah, he's, he's been great. He's been unbelievable in the Six Nations. And hopefully, he can keep his form up until the World Cup. And of course, you open the Six Nations against Italy, and they give you quite a tough game at the in Paris last year. They scored quite a few. Good tries. How important is it not just to win that game, but you know, without being and flattering to Italy, get a bonus point because it seems like the other side might get a bonus point against Italy as well. Yeah, let's listen. First, a win is also the mo- always the most important. Um, I think it's not just not just getting that bo- bonus points against Italy, but last year what it hurt us as well is losing a getting a defensive, bo- giving England a defensive bonus point. So always, yeah, look at it that way as well. Um, Italy, France, always a it's two Latin teams competing, and it's 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 quite a tough game. Um, where I feel it's a different context when an English team play Italy. Yeah. So, yeah, we'll we'll take it. We'll we'll be happy with the win if we can get a bonus point. That'll 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 be super. But um, yeah, just go through the six. Nine. If we can win all the all the games, that'll be great. Mm. It, it almost feels like the Six Nations was was snatched from your grasp. But that's what it felt like to me because France was so good in the Six Nations and it was just maybe that one instant, the red card against Scotland that may have may have cost you the Grand Slam. Um, there was also that game against England in the Autumn Nations Cup where you fielded, well, virtually, as you may, may, may think, a B team. How impressed were you with that B team? Because I don't think many people give France a chance in that game. But yeah. bar a few refereeing decisions, you should, might have probably won that game. Yeah, that was yeah, that was a, a big game. I mean, they they pulled out everything they've got, and um, also puts a lot of pressure on us. That's that's first choices, or that there was first choices during the Six Nations, and seeing these other players coming in and doing well in your position. So, younger guys and and, and different players. So, yeah, I think it's a great thing for the French team to have a uh, great context to know there's a bit of depth and there's this guy. So no one should feel secure in their places. They always work harder to to try being the best in the in the country and still be selected for the national team. Away from the Six Nations, something that's probably been uh, proposed by the supporters, I don't know if you've seen it online. Of course, we got the British Lions tour this, this summer and there's been a lot of talk of maybe uh, the Lions tour in France rather than South Africa. How special would that be? Oh, that'll be really cool. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I would definitely like to go see. Hopefully it's not in... Hopefully they can have some supporters by then but um yeah I, I haven't even seen the news so that's exciting exciting hopefully but it would be different it would, it would be a completely different context as well playing going British Islands going to South Africa that's it's different playing in France would would take something special away from it I reckon well finally before you go Bern is it okay if we finish with a quick fire round yeah go ahead. brilliant yeah. right so firstly Bernard who's the best player that you've played with um Dan Carter Pull our name out of the bag. <laughs> uh, best play you've come up against? Uh, Sam Andil. Uh, best friend in rugby? Wenceslas Lorek. I thought you were going to say Jamie Roberts. Oh my <laughs> <laughs> uh, your favourite coach during your career? I really enjoy Fabien Galtier. Yeah. Uh, best match that you've been involved in? Every match we've been in England. <laughs> That's <laughs> <laughs> same with us, but <laughs> uh, worst drinker that you've played with, <laughs> Mike Phillips. <laughs> Mike Phillips. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Uh, I can believe that as well. <laughs> uh, well, this might be Mike Phillips as well. Biggest troublemaker on and off the field? Uh, probably Tiri Toma. Finally, Bernard, if you, well, you've said about your swimming. Finally, if you weren't a rugby player, what would have been your dream job? I've got a big passion for the ocean, marine biologist. Well, Bernard, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on the show. Uh, all the best tomorrow and in the Six Nations, apart from when you play Wales. Uh, and yeah, hopefully we can get you back on in the future. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed being here and um, have a great show.